You are now listening to Protecting Your Nest with board-certified family medicine and obesity medicine specialist, Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com. Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. And since this is the weekend after Thanksgiving, which is celebrated in the U.S., Canada, Brazil, and a few other places, I wanted to wish everybody listening who celebrates this holiday a happy belated Thanksgiving Day. During my training to become a physician, one of the statements we had to repeat that is very hard to forget was a statement written by Hippocrates and is part of the Hippocratic Oath, and it states, first, do no harm. No doctor or other clinician intentionally tries to harm their patients, but what I did not know at the time was that if I only treated my patients with medications without fully understanding another statement made by Hippocrates, and that is, let food be thy medicine, then I may actually be harming the patients I have a fiduciary duty to. Based on the same training many of us received in medical school, we were taught to follow the old paradigm, which suggested that there is not enough medical science to support using food to treat medical conditions. I've since learned that there is plenty of evidence to support this approach. One source I will share with you, which will help add to your understanding of today's discussion, is Dr. Daniel Amen's book, The End of Mental Illness, where he shares over 286 scientific citations of dietary interventions that improve mental health, including conditions like depression, anxiety, and others. One source I will share with you, which will help you add to your understanding of today's discussion, is Dr. Amon's book, The End of Mental Illness, where he shares over 286 scientific citations of dietary interventions that improve mental health, including conditions like depression, anxiety, and others. Yes, you can heal your brain. I mentioned Dr. Daniel Amen as a resource because today we will talk about the connection between your brain health and your physical health with my guest, Dr. Jasmine Searcy. Challenging minds, changing minds and uplifting the human spirit, that's a quote from Dr. Jasmine, is the central mission of Dr. Jasmine Searcy. She is a licensed clinical health psychologist at Near North Health Services Corporation, which is actually a federally qualified health center. I actually worked at one of those prior to joining Advocate Aurora. Dr. Searcy is unique among her peers, having earned her master's of science degree in clinical and community counseling from John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and a doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Jackson State University, of course, in Jackson, Mississippi. And prior to Near North, Dr. Searcy provided behavioral health services in a variety of settings, including hospitals and community clinics, and most recently at La Rabida in Chicago, Illinois. She also currently serves as clinical lecturer, professor, and course director or developer at one of our finer institutions, and that's Northwestern University. At Near North Health, Dr. Searcy specializes in collaborating with primary care docs like myself, uh, including pediatrics, et cetera, and specialty providers like those who are very specialized in early intervention services for HIV HIV as an example, in efforts to provide trauma-informed assessment therapy and consultation services. And as you are fully aware, most of us are experiencing the trauma of living in a pandemic as we speak. In her work, she offers an eclectic set of evidence-based interventions, including cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, clinical hypnosis, and parent management training to patients presenting with general outpatient mental health concerns, things like, you know, of course, depression, anxiety, et cetera, and complications secondary to chronic or acute medical conditions like diabetes. The focus of her practice is the interactions 
between the mind and the body and a powerful and the powerful ways in which biological psychological and social factors affect physical health and well-being additionally dr cersei has published journal articles across a range of clinical topics including post traumatic stress disorder and pediatric sickle cell disease now she does have hobbies even though she's busy she has run several 5k and 10k walks and runs including the infamous chicago half marathon before pursuing psychology she was featured in ebony magazine that was around april 2018 as miss jackson state university dr cersei has been given countless motivational and mental health seminars to various audiences to include community and social groups and a variety of organizations such as the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and American Psychological Association. She's also a member of the esteemed Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and was recently inducted into the 2021 Impact Leadership Development Program cohort with the Chicago Urban League, to name a few. When she is not engaging in her work, She enjoys opportunities for civic engagement, spending time with her energetic family, and of course, running and biking. Why do I love being a podcast host, you may ask? Well, it provides a rare opportunity to have a one-on-one conversation with someone like Dr. Jasmine, unfiltered, insightful, and filled with the potential for collaboration and growth. Even better, the ability to share it with others like yourself. So I thank you, Dr. Cersei, for giving me the opportunity to share a conversation about mental health with my audience, and I welcome you to Protecting Your Nest. So how are you doing? I am doing good. Thank you so much. And I want to just say, uh, before I kind of uh, add to the introduction that you did. It was wonderful to say happy Turkey Day to everyone who's listening um, or past Turkey Day or Thanksgiving, however you celebrate. And thank you for joining us. Um, I'm here. I'm present. How about you, Dr. Hampton? <laughs> it's It's been good. And I'll be honest, I cheated and I had some uh, my, I think I had a cousin who had made some macaroni and cheese. It wasn't from cauliflower. And I also had some dressing. <laughs> I promised my mom, I said, if I don't, if we don't gather, I promise to eat whatever you put in front of me. So I'll have my second day of a more uh, starchier form of food. And I think maybe the first holiday in a couple of two or three years where I actually cheated. So uh, hopefully my body will respond, but so far so good. So thank you for asking. Absolutely. Well, that sounds delicious. I think I, um, I wouldn't say cheat, but I I uh, overstretched the carbs for myself, but I did eat a vegan peanut butter chocolate cake versus the regular dessert. So I am proud of myself for that. So. Well, good for you. I think Dr. <laughs> uh, Terry Mason, one of our buddy partners in crime, he would be very happy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so. Too funny. So let's get started. Um, I definitely tried to do you justice with your wonderful introduction. I am curious, however, what led you to choose a profession that deals with mental health and especially that uh, trauma. What kind of got you in that space? Oh, well, that's a a great question. And thank you for asking. Um, I think that's the golden question for my families and everyone I come in contact. I think one, there are three things that really got me interested with, uh, well, to become a psychologist and to two, really to develop my niche into work uh, related to trauma. I think one was my own experience as trauma as a child, which that was the number one. I kind of made my, my, uh, my, you know, I made my experiences my passion. And then number two, as an intern and fellow um, in psychology, I was able to follow the work of Dr. Nadine uh, Burke, who's actually a developmental pediatrician. And now she's a surgeon general of uh, California. And I was actually able to follow her work on fellowship regarding ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And it was through my work that I really uh, was able to understand and conceptualize how important trauma was for the the individual, specifically as it relates to long-term consequences, as it relates to health and um, 
physical aspects of health. So that's the second. And then the third one is just, I had great uh, mentors and individuals who trained me in the field. And it kind of, it kind of challenged me as well as my uh, clinical uh, work, whether it was children, youth, families, or young adults that I was working with. And it really switched my mind or my my clinical work from Mm -hmm. asking what is wrong with you to really what has happened to you, right? So I think Dr. Harris and her work really influenced that um, in the later years for me. So, so, so let's, I'm thinking about the brain. You mentioned the brain and your comments. And when I put your um, opening uh, intro together, I clearly noticed that you had done some work in the space of hypnosis and I think most of us in our training didn't get a lot of training about hypnosis. We know that it may or may not help people. So I'm very curious if you can comment about hypnosis and how you use it and do you find it very effective? Absolutely. That's a great question. So when we think about hypnosis, I kind of want to clear, you know, just the air. Most individuals that I talk to, the first thing I ask is, what do you think about hypnosis? And most people say it's when people try to control the mind. And it's absolutely not that. Hypnosis is also um, it's a field within itself. Um, in the field of psychology. And it's also referred to as hypnosis or hypnotherapy. And the way in which I use hypnosis, when we think about the term, is just a focused state of attention or concentration. Okay, that's all it is. So pretend as though if you're listening to this current podcast that think about Thanksgiving or cooking or baking in the kitchen or even driving. Oftentimes we're so focused and thinking about other things that we end up at our destination and not realize what happened in between. So hypnosis is sort of like that. And the way in which I use that is I use it for pain control um, patients who come um, specifically with medical conditions. So I use it for uh, young adults, children, across the lifespan, individuals who have medical conditions, whether they're acute or chronic, such as burns, cancer, perhaps uh, mothers have recently given uh, birth to a child. Some patients come with irritable bowel syndrome, and we'll talk about that as it relates to the uh, long-term consequences of stress. Um, I have individuals who come in uh, with hot flashes related to menopause or any behavioral changes. If I'm thinking about uh, individuals who have insomnia, children who may be bedwetting or even smoking or overeating, hypnosis um, in sessions can help target those symptoms and decrease symptoms um, overall, okay? And so typically I use hypnosis as an adjunct treatment. So I do use cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness, but I also integrate hypnosis, um, which is just a focused state um, that anyone could use, um, to kind of help them target the symptoms or any presenting concerns that they have. So, yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, meditation. So I think that's less scary when you think about um, meditation. So I think I can work with that. I'm not as uh, spooked out anymore. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And I do want to add, when we think about hypnosis or hypnotherapy, there are tons of research, thousands of studies. Uh, hypnosis have been really uh, used, uh, thinking about psychologists, psychiatrists, um, even medical providers have been using it for over 100 years. And it, it has been found to be very helpful for mental health period, whether it's anxiety or depression or improving pain related concerns um, in uh, those who present with headaches, migraines or cancer, period. And you said something really, really well, uh, Dr. Hampton. A lot of times when I'm explaining hypnosis and what exactly it is, I do compare it to meditation or uh, using mindfulness right? Because it's a focused state of mind that we're really engaging in ourselves. That's, you can think of hypnosis in that area. And some of the um, therapies overlap when it comes to treatment. So yes, absolutely. Perfect. So speaking of how you feel and being a little afraid, I'm not sure 
you feel this way every time you do things, but like even recording a podcast, making a YouTube video, <laughs> getting in front of people and speaking, there's always some level of anxiety or stress. Um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about whether stress is bad for us and and maybe describe some of the consequences of what happens to your body if you have a long-term exposure to stress? Because I've always heard that that's not a good idea. Yes. So we do have different types of stress. And this is what I tell uh, individuals who come to see me. Um, All stress, I would say, is good, right? If it's normal stress. And normal stress is meeting a deadline, uh, stress about For example, I'm getting on this podcast with a very renowned uh, Dr. Hampton, you know, that's normal stress. Or even we think about, um, you know, stress of cooking that first uh, maybe meal for Thanksgiving (laughs) and we just have a little stress. Maybe it's not going to be like grandmother or mom's famous uh, dressing or whatnot. But when we think about long term or toxic stress, so we have acute stress, which is just short, but then we have Chronic stress, which is stress that's just stressors that happens over and over and over again. And it's chronic because we think about chronic in the nature of this is the stress that's happening in the individual their system cannot tolerate it, right? Whether that's they haven't built up the coping mechanisms, whether it's stressors happen over and over again. And that's when stress really affects the body. And that's when we really see the mind-body connection, okay? We also think about chronic stress. We kind of think of the term trauma too, or vicarious trauma, because chronic stress could be an adverse experience or a trauma experience. And so when we think about stress, whether it's acute or chronic or a trauma, now it's maybe a little T or big T trauma. Now we're thinking how it's affecting our muscles, our respiratory system, our cardiovascular system, uh, whether that's endocrine system and um, GI stuff, when we think about gastrointestinal um, stuff that could go on. And so when I think about the mind-body connection and stress, I think about our muscles. I think the first thing is tension in our body, right? I think about our respiratory. Sometimes I see patients and they've they've gone to the ER and have had multiple rule outs and medical uh, rule outs for um, heart problems, right? And they can't, uh, because of the anxiety or stress, they cannot really gasp their breath, right? So I have to teach them different coping mechanisms to really Uh, be able to relax, right? And um, notice what's going on with their body. I also think about the endocrine, right? So we think about the fight or flight response and the cortisol that's released um, in our bodies. And I also think about the redu- uh, reproductive system um, because, you know, when we think about the reproductive system, sometimes uh, when women want to uh, procreate or con- uh, conceive, stress can also um take a toll on the body that way. So again, the mind and body are connected. And I just wanted to mention some, but not all of the ways. That's that good. Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. Um, and it's so important. It's, it's almost like the field is old, but new. It's like we kind of knew this stuff, but now we're getting more information to kind of help us make those connections. Maybe some of that is science that, we hadn't really dove a little deeper into and we're starting to, maybe we can find those neurotransmitters and find the connections better. But either way, I think it's great news. I was curious before we move on, I know you experimented with cooking this holiday. So how did everything (laughs) turn out for you? (laughs) Yes. So, um, you know, due to COVID and everyone just kind of spacing out and some family stuff, I was tasked to cook uh, three side dishes and I did try my first uh, chicken, rosemary, garlic chicken. And I was stressed, right? Because I was <laughs> concerned that it wouldn't have come out. I, I really don't cook a lot because I'm more of health focus. And so I, I focus more on like proteins, but not more of the seasoning. So I had to step out the box and it, it came out very well. I had an A plus rating. Uh, for Good. that. So <laughs> I'm very happy with that. So my stress levels are a little lower uh, compared to yesterday. So That's all I need to hear. want to keep the doctor healthy as well. So perfect. So 
Wow, that's interesting. Um, one of my uh, new patients this week was actually referred to me by one of my Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity brothers. And for those not terribly aware of the typical African-American divine nine black Greek letter organization uh, concept, the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity that I belong to was founded in 1906. And uh, the Alpha Kappa Alpha fraternity or sorority was founded in 1908. And as I mentioned in the intro, Dr. Circe's an AKA, which is kind of cool. But what you may not know is that uh, her sorority is a sister sorority to my fraternity, which is kind of cool. So I kind of discovered that as I did research on you. Uh, but what's interesting is that um, when I met this fraternity brother, this new patient, I normally would greet him, you know, with a, a secret handshake, right? And <laughs> But because of COVID, I really couldn't do that, right? So things have really changed and it's really uh, hard to get used to. So anyway, so we're very social creatures, as you know, Dr. Cersei. And I was curious, you know, not being able to be as social as we normally are, what effect has this had on us? And, you know, because we're really discouraged from touching and, you know, we're social distancing. I couldn't eat at my mom's house, you know. So oh, what, no, yeah. what's your thoughts on the impact this is having on us? It's definitely an adjustment, right? Um, I think when I think about touch, because um, I think about touch is really the fundamental language of connection. And so how I really compare not being able to touch amid COVID and just even thinking about family, I think about the parent-child bond or two friends or romantic partners or even take uh, your fraternity or my sorority because I typically hug. Um, I hug children I work with. I, I shake hands with their families. And, you know, it's how we communicate. And I think those who are more extroverted are really probably having difficulties right now compared to introverted individuals or temperament style. So it depends on your temperament regarding how you've adjusted to this. Um, I can tell you I'm an extrovert um, all the way. I love right. touching. Um, when we think about love languages, which is by Gary Chapman, one of my love languages, intimacy or touch. That's how I show that I care, that I'm involved. And I think for me, amid COVID, it's been hard. And individuals who express their whatever it is for individuals, they I'm not going to say they're suffering, but I'm sure it has been a big adjustment, okay, because we are social creatures. Now, those who may not have been uh, the so-called touchy person or used uh, different ways to show it, I think they've adjusted it well, too. But I think now we've all, we're have all we almost a year into this COVID thing, so I think we're transitioning. But I think about the people who live by themselves as it relates to what's going on with COVID and not being able to touch or communicate with anyone um, as it relates to uh, your question, you know? So I think yep. it's hard. Yeah. I think it's been a transition, but I think each day will get better. And I think when we think about touch, we just have to be creative, right? And continue to use creative ways to connect. So if it's not touching, it's a virtual high five or a virtual hug. I know I do that with my patients, especially my kiddos. I'm so used to hugging and giving a high five or saying great job, even with parents. And now I find myself saying, give me a virtual high five or a hug. And for me, that still gives me the same effect. It's been an adjustment, but finding creative ways um, is just what we're going to have to do. So, <laughs> yes. I'm definitely, I, I was thinking about that, that great book you quoted. Um, I love that book. And I think for me, my love language is uh, words of affirmation. So, for anybody listening who has not read The Five Love Languages, please get that book, read it, find out what your love language is, find out who your partners uh, may be, find out what their love language is. I just think that that's an easy and quick way to improve the relationships we have. So I love that and uh, appreciate you bringing it up. So, And one thing I've learned about... Um, you know, is that mental health is good for physical health, you know, as you know, so it's like, I know that that's true. So I want to 
um, think about that in reverse first. So, so imagine physical health being good for mental health. You know, I, I've heard that, I've read studies that say if you do things that are good for your body, it's good for your mental health. So to give me some thoughts on how important taking care of your body physically is going to be for your mental health. Absolutely. So physical health, anything that we're doing, and I'm thinking about, um, you know, just a couple of patients that I've, I have been seeing, whether it's for anxiety or depression. One thing I think about and what I tell patients is when we move, right, whether that's we're stretching, we're um, engaging in yoga or different poses, or if we're taking a walk or taking our dog out, or even if you're at home and let's say you have been um, impaired physically from moving in some ways, even sitting and laying down on the mat helps those neurotransmitters or re- really those chemicals in the brain that control mood, right? Or the way we respond, such as serotonin, right? Levels. Um, I think when we think about mood, um, thinking about sadness, depression, um, irritability, anything related to depression and anxiety, moving, physical activity, anything related to exercise gets us moving and those neurotransmitters in our brains going. So it will improve those levels for us overall. Nice. So I'm going to exercise tonight. And I have (laughs) noticed, yes, and I have noticed um, it does improve mood big time. So um, it's just amazing. I even heard, you know, exercise is as good as Prozac. So if that's Mm -hmm. true, let's do that instead. So that's awesome. What about sleep? Um, That's dealing with something physical. And what, what impact does sleep have on mental health? Oh, sleep is very good. If we're not, you know, thinking about an adult, um, there are uh, obviously a number of hours that an adult should receive a night. Let's talk about basic sleep hygiene, right? But thinking about mental health and sleep, if I'm not getting enough sleep and I already have anxiety and I already have symptoms of depression, I'm probably going to be more irritable, right? Um, If I haven't gotten enough sleep, more than likely, I'm not going to be able to concentrate or attend to my job, my kids, my family, uh, things that are important to my everyday uh, level of functioning. Um, If I'm not getting sleep, sometimes maybe I'm so irritable or even if I have a chronic medical condition, I'm irritable and my body is just tired that maybe that would increase the level of pain. I'm not able to regulate my pain. So everything is connected here. You know, when we do not get enough sleep, it looks like we have ADHD. It may even look like we're anxious or other things because we haven't gotten enough rest that our body really needs. So Excellent. And I have experienced all of that. I remember when I was not exercising regularly. Um, I just didn't feel as good. And what I really prioritized, I think that I did this mostly for this during this year is I, I prioritized sleep. So I always try to get those seven hours in. It makes a huge difference. So oh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to make sure, I'm glad you shared uh, some thoughts on that because I think people really need to understand that. So one of the things that um, I've also thought about is this idea that we really get a lot of pleasure from food. And because we get so much pleasure for it, it kind of makes us kind of addicted to it. So (laughs) what's your thoughts about that? I mean, how do you stop eating all these addictive foods or what's your, how do you deal with that in your practice? Yeah. You know, in my practice, I see, you know, on one hand, I see individuals who come in strictly for uh, mental health difficulties or concerns. And then on the other hand, I see individuals who may have mental health difficulties such as anxiety, depression, or disordered uh, eating patterns and a medical condition. And I think about um, a patient in particular or an example, and I think about perhaps someone who has been diagnosed with 
type 2 diabetes, um, as well as uh, obesity. And they have also had a history of trauma or anxiety, right? And so the first thing that they may come to me and say is that I'm anxious, I have this history of trauma. However, I'm also trying to lose weight and get my uh, diabetes under control, right? And so when they come to me, the first thing I ask as it relates to eating or thinking about disorder eating patterns and the medical piece. I think about um, me talking to that patient and really understanding like the physiological mechanisms underlying eating behavior, right? Because that kind of tells me the function of what the eating is about. So for example, some individuals um, could be eating from an emotional standpoint, right? Um, if there's no medical condition or, or medical uh, condition that really explains that eating, then I go over what do we do when we're lonely, when we're isolated? Um, if it's emotional eating piece, then I kind of talk about eating and food as an addiction as we think about the opioid crisis, because sometimes eating or disordered eating patterns could be addictive in nature. And specifically, if it's eating sugar or any carbs or anything with sugar, sugar is compared in some studies um, to the same as um, any drugs that are addictive as well. So I think about when we think about eating an addiction period, a food addiction could develop, right, as a result of emotional eating um, from a long-term standpoint. So That's fair. And we definitely have talked about this topic with the processed food addiction author, Dr. Joan Iflin, but it sounds like what I'm hearing from you and probably from her is that there, you know, there's a subset of patients who need extra help and you have to kind of look for that and, you know, kind of harvest those things from these folks so you'll know they need that help. So that's that's good to know. You know, anybody listening, when you, if you're struggling, that's got to be on the table. You know, do I have addictive behaviors that require extra attention. Yeah. So I, I like that that's available. Another interesting um, uh, source of uh, things that can impact our brain is what I learned in my nutrition training, which is a leaky gut. And it's weird that, I mean, again, every time I talk about leaky gut, it's weird because we didn't <laughs> learn in medical school. But, but basically, you know, having... Uh, a gut that's allowing the absorption of the wrong stuff, uh, like large proteins that shouldn't be absorbed, which then could lead to allergies and inflammation, and which then could lead to brain fog and depression, anxiety, and all of that kind of crazy stuff. And there's many reasons for it. Too many antibiotics when you're young, maybe even a C-section delivery instead of a vaginal delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. I don't know. So I'm curious. In your training, was there ever any talk of leaky gut as it relates to how it can impact your brain? Is that all news to you or is this something they actually did bring up during your training? Yeah. Now, in my training, because I'm more of like a medical or health psychologist, now there was extensive training how the mind and body are connected. So when we think about the leaky gut, it can lead, we know that it can lead to chronic diseases. However, the term leaky gut in any behavioral health training, no, that's definitely a new terminology that has been used. And I am looking for behavioral health uh, now CEUs related to that, you know, um, just from meeting you. But from a medical psychologist standpoint, we focus more on the mind body connection, which includes the terminology leaky gut, right? So if you're a medical yeah, yeah, psychologist, yeah you already know that's embedded because we know that a leaky gut can lead to chronic diseases um, as well as mental health concerns, right? So I think that's a term that's slowly being coined in the field. And as of now, I'm not sure of any CEU trainings, but I will be looking for it, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think, well, part of why I'm getting extra training is to fill those gaps because I find that, First of all, patients love when you can deviate from the standard way of treating disease and have some other options because a lot of times by the time they get to us, they've already tried a lot of the traditional stuff. Everything that we've learned in the textbook, they've tried. So now we need to start thinking 
more about the root cause and thinking outside the box. So that's one of the things that's been very helpful um, that I've seen in my practice. And people kind of flock to you when they see you speak in a different language in, <laughs> in a way. So it's kind of cool, you know. Yes. But um, if you just want to help people and you it, you don't want to be frustrated because you can't give them a different path to right, or a different right. possibility and then and and they really are just looking for hope i don't should i have to live this way for the rest of my life so yeah so it's it's, it's pretty deep it's kind of scary so i know that uh because we're living in uh covid uh there's a lot of fears related to covid and some are legit i think i was so afraid when it first started some are exaggerated which is why i don't watch the, the news a lot so but anyway, when it first came to our shores, um, I felt like it just was a challenge for most clinicians and things are a little bit better. I think people, even though we're kind of spiking again, but but I also know that for me personally, it was really my thoughts that framed how I saw it, right? Mm-hmm. So when you think about fear and how we think, and I actually, I think even before we uh, talk today, I sent you one of my favorite uh, videos. <laughs> yes. But, but, and so, so <laughs> you may want to share what that was because yes. it really, yeah, t- talk a little bit about our thoughts and even share that video that I sent, which I encourage everybody to listen to whenever they feel a little down. Yeah. So in the the way in which I talk about thoughts in my practice, well, the song, first of all, was Happy by Pharrell. And that song came out and it goes something like this, because I'm happy, you know, and it uh, it's very interactive and engaging. So if you can YouTube it, definitely if you haven't heard of it. But it came out in 2014. And immediately when I heard that song, uh, Dr. Hampton, I listened to it and it made me smile and it kind of shifted my mood. Not that I was having a good, uh, a bad day, but it kind of reminded me or took me back to fellowship when I did a, a info commercial for the hospital that I was at um, to introduce you know, happiness to everyone and this whole shift in the way we think. And so when I actually work with patients, I introduce them to uh, the cognitive behavioral triangle. So we have this triangle and we have our thoughts, right? And that triangle at the top. And then we have our emotions from our thoughts and then behaviors, right? And then we also talk about cognitive distortions. There are over 20 types of cognitive distortions. That would take a whole nother two hours to discuss. But the more we have negative or bad thoughts, right? The more we focus on uh, negative thoughts, the more likely we are to hold on to those bad thoughts, right? So what I often tell patients is every time you have a negative thought, try to combat it or try to weigh out the evidence for it. So for example, I'll never build a business like my dad, right? We can also think of alternative thoughts or really challenge that thought to really help us kind of move, keep our feet moving from that negative thought. But all in all, I do tell people if we're having negative thoughts, it's going to impact our day, it's going to impact our week. If they continue to keep coming, it even may continue to impact our month if it's 30 days plus that we're having negative thoughts. And the more negative thoughts, sometimes that can lead and or roll into psychopathology. So the more negative thoughts we're having, it can increase our levels of anxiety and depression. So I often um, recommend engaging in mindfulness, meditation, physical exercise, or even using some cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for themselves to kind of help them move forward from those thoughts. Because our thoughts are powerful, the mind, body, It's powerful within itself if you're listening to this podcast. So I think if people are able to engage and can keep their feet moving, they're able to become resilient or shake things off uh, more effectively. I was just thinking as you were talking about, you know, what resources would be available. And obviously when I shared that video, um, I was, that was a resource. That's a nice YouTube video, a happy song that I think you can play anytime you're feeling down. But when you're dealing with your clients, what resources do you recommend that they use to help them when they're dealing with the trauma, particularly the trauma of COVID, but for any trauma? 
Right, right. So it, it depends the level. So I think when we think about COVID, the first thing I think about is people worrying or getting um, anxiety related symptoms. And so with that, I, I often recommend it's called the CBT um, thought record diary, and it's actually a free app on um, the Apple Store or Android. There are also other ones um, like Virtual Hope Box. That's V I R T U A L Hope, like you hope H O P E, and then Box, where it has different games on there. It has breathing exercise, meditation, where individuals are able to engage in that app to uh, distract themselves or come up with a different redirection for that day or week. Um, there's also um, a cognitive behavioral therapy app called Mood Kit. M-O-O-D-K-I-T, which is also free on the Apple Store. Um, I also have different ones, um, and it depends if there are safety concerns. So if someone is really depressed, um, there's a My3 app, which is free, where they can kind of come up with a coping plan for the day um, for how they will get through the day or resources that they can get um, reach out to on that app. Um, I would say my favorite anxiety apps um, include Mind Shift. So that's M I N D Shift S H I F T. Um, that's a free app where you know individuals can go on, and it's uh, really designed for adults with anxiety, and it just kind of challenges um, how we think about anxiety. Um, I've talked about the CBT thought diary. Um, there are a lot more <laughs> that I could talk about, but I don't want to, uh, you know, talk ten minutes about it. But those are some apps. There are so many more apps. Um, that could be on the app store that are for free. Um, now, for those who um, have developed, you know, what I call the carious trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder, there's an app called PTSD Coach and Breathe to Relax. And those are free apps that they can go on um, to combat or target symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So, Excellent. I am shocked because, to be honest with you, other than MindShift, I hadn't heard of most of those apps. So I hope that this really helps my audience in terms of giving them some resources because I think when you walk away from a conversation like this, you just want to have something actionable that you can do. And, um, and I'm also thinking as you're talking, I'm thinking about you as a clinician. I do have the wonderful Dr. Paul the chant uh, who wrote the book on preventing physician burnout, uh, who I hope will join me on a podcast episode in the very near future. And I'm thinking about the fact that, yes, our patients are struggling with COVID, but man, could you imagine being in the ICU as a doctor, right? Or a nurse. And so it's uh, even more stress. So as you think about your profession, because you're kind of charged with talking to people when they're kind of at their their, their low point, or you, I hate to say it that way, but when they're struggling and they're having difficulties. So how do you, uh, what do you do for yourself? I know you walk and run and do that type of stuff, but do you have some things that you do besides these uh, great tools that you just mentioned? Absolutely. So, you know, when we think about, you know, as a psychologist, I'm constantly working with patients. And I think, uh, so are you, Dr. Hampton, and maybe some of individuals who are listening to this podcast, aside from exercising, um, waking up, I meditate, um, I read great books. And one of the great books that I'm reading or have read, I read it over and over, is called Trauma Stewardship. And it's really an everyday, uh, everyday guide to like caring for um, oneself while caring for others. So in, anyone who's caring for others, this will be a great book. And so, for example, when I talk to providers or patients who often have to come in contact with individuals, I talk about something called vicarious trauma. Right. So let's think about anxiety. Let's think about what we bring to the room when we meet patients. Um, so whether that's anxiety, depression, our own worries, our own histories of trauma, then we meet a patient and have to hear their own experience of trauma. We kind of think of the term 
vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue. It's real, right? And we go through it, right? But I also use when I feel fatigue, right? Um, because we all do. I also use an app called Resilience, right? So this is a free app where I can check in when I come to work and sit down at eight o'clock. I check in what my mood is for the day. I think about the quote from the book, Trauma Stewardship, which is by Dr. Lipsky and Connie Burke. And you can find it on Amazon. And I think about a quote from the book that says, I come in and I focus on what I could get done for the day. So if it's walking out the day with seeing eight patients successfully without doing A, B, C, and D, I focus on what I can do. And then at the end of the day, I check in on that resilience app about what I did and I don't take anything else with me home or I try not to, okay? Sometimes it it doesn't work that way. But I also provide myself compassion. I I always have uh, my own sand for myself before I start my day and make sure I use my strategies, right? So that I can be more resilient as this year ends and as, you know, the next year um, finishes or, or begins because we we know that COVID may not, It's not going to be over. (laughs) So I have to make sure that I'm prepared um, by doing all of those things that I just stated. So absolutely. Definitely want to focus on the caregivers. Definitely, again, another resource I wasn't familiar with. So I'm definitely looking forward to using that resource as well. The brain is a very uh, complex uh, structure and it's so important And I just think that we have to give it a little attention and care. And you're probably more aware than me about, you know, the parts of the brain and what they do. And I know our thoughts are important and I know that it affects our stress level and how we think. And could you just speak a little bit about, you know, how the brain works in terms of the different areas of the brain. Just a few thoughts on that. I was just, that just came to my brain literally now. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so the m- more important parts of the brain that are important when we think about the mind-body connection um, and mental health specifically, I think about the frontal lobe, okay, or the prefrontal cortex, which is really responsible for like planning and organizing and even making decisions, right? So something is presented to us and we have to think proactively. That's the part of the brain that's very important when we think about our mental health, because our decisions really affect our behaviors and emotions. When you think about cognitive behavioral therapy and the cognitive triangle. So therefore, the frontal lobe is very important. When I think about the hippocampus, um, I think about memory. Okay. So when we think about uh, COVID as a stressor, we also think about other traumatic or adverse life experiences that we have had in the memories um, that have been embedded since we were infant to now and how added memories could also uh, affect the way we respond thinking about mental health and the mind body and uh, mind body connection I also think about the cerebellum which is coordination and processing skills but I also think um, about other areas of the brain, um, thinking about cortisol levels and the HPA axis um, which is very important to really depend how we respond to stress, whether it's acute or chronic. Those are the primary uh, major parts of the brain that I think about. So, Yeah, that's cool. I, it's really making me, I, I recently uh, saw a statement from the International Society for Nutritional Psychiatry Research Consensus Statement. So they had a statement they made. And, and basically what they said is that nutrition should now be considered as mainstream elements of psychiatric practice with research, education, policy, and health promotion reflecting this new paradigm. Uh, It just sounds like gradually we're trying to move the ship from the current model where we just diagnose things and treat it to a new model where we literally try to figure out um, what the root cause is and, and, and let's try to treat it naturally because there's probably, it's difficult to treat all these conditions, uh, without 
thinking about the total patient as opposed to trying to find that perfect chemical that's going to work for them. So I think that's really important to hear. And I'm actually excited that they made that statement. Absolutely. And it looks like it once again, the mind and body is connected. So when we think about nutrition, we think about the prefrontal cortex. So the decisions, the decisions to what we consume and take in our bodies could really uh, make a difference in our mental and physical health overall. Yeah, it makes sense. And I also want to comment, um, and I'm going to my uh, one thought that I want to definitely touch on, and I, I had asked you what type of training you guys had, you know, in certain areas, but I'm not sure that your training, just like mine, talked about the, you know, like the bacteria in the gut. So did mm-hmm. you get much training on that? No, not at all. That's the thing. Now, there are specific uh, rotations to psychi- uh, psychologists, not psychiatrists, but psychologists. So if you're doing health psychology, you're you're learning the big term of mind, mind and body, but you're having those different rotations, whether that's HEMOC, if you're doing family medicine, uh, GI stuff, but never was there a major um, uh, direction or influence or topics as it relates to gut health. Got you. I'll- I'll share what I learned uh, recently about the microbiome. Because again, I had the same experience as you. And to me, it's almost like I'm being re-educated all over again. It's just bizarre, you know? So one of the thing, one of the examples as it relates to the role that the microbiome or the bacteria in your belly uh, plays in neurotransmitter function. So An example is how lactobacillus, which is a type of bacteria, produces acetylcholine. And too much can equal depression, and too little can increase your risk for dementia. So, and of course, most people have heard the term acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to treat dementia. So that part makes sense. What didn't make sense is that the lactobacillus bacteria has something to do with it. And I also learned recently that organisms like Canada, Streptococcus, E. coli, and Enterococcus produce serotonin. I'm mm. like, you got to be kidding. Oh, so wow. Yeah. Imagine if you had an unhealthy gut, you could have trouble. But if you have a healthy gut, you may actually decrease your risk for depression, anxiety, and maybe even improve your cognition and your sleep. So those are just important. But the bigger message I wanted to share is that there's a thousand species of gut bacteria. So just imagine a company trying to come up with a supplement with the right, Uh, you know, know. (laughs) bacteria for your gut, right? The chances are they're not going to be able to come up with that. But what they found is that bacteria, they flourish with proper nutrition. So if you do nutrition right, then you can get your, your gut right And then you can reduce your risk for a lot of conditions, mood disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, and and cognitive disorders. So what I love about uh, this new science is that it's going to give us a a more natural path, but most of it is going to come right back around to uh, the concepts I teach with this nest and rope, which is, you know, nutrition, uh, exercise, which you mentioned earlier. Uh We talked about, you know, sleep and stress. All of those things, how you think, all of that nest stuff is actually exactly what uh, will help people. And and I'll bring up Dr. Amen one more time because (laughs) he's so awesome, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen. And he has a, if and we'll put this in the show notes, but he has a website, www.brainhealthassessment.com. And with that, you can actually put in the information about your own life and your own brain. And he can actually point you to, I think there's, you know, I don't know, 15 or so brain types. And then he can then make recommendations on what we should eat to help our brain. Obviously that's going to the stomach first. So even the expert on the brain and in his space is very much interested in sharing that. But the first thing he talks about is sugar and starch. We need to avoid that. And and processed foods, we need to avoid that. And then uh, foods that cook with pesticides, we need to avoid that. And of course, he'll recommend different vitamins 
like B vitamins and vitamin D, et cetera, omega-3, things that are helpful for the brain. But, but again, if you have a specific type of personality, brain type, it may be more useful to figure out which one. So I think that's something we all need to look into. And, and I just think it's really important that we think about this whole ideal of wellness and how that'll affect our brain. So I just wanted to share those uh, important little tidbits because I think people may find value. So, so I wanted to ask you, how are you, like in terms of big picture, uh, how you think about what we've talked about, any kind of take home messages that you would like to share that really mean a lot to you, things that you share with your patients that think are really critical for us to be successful with our mind and body. Yes. I, you know, the first thing I think about is the ABCs. This is what I leave with my patients. Okay. So the A is become aware. So we've talked a lot about uh, wellness. We've talked about stress, whether that's acute or chronic. We've talked about the curious trauma. We've talked about, um, what we may come to the table with as individuals, where it's our own trauma histories or own mental health histories. The first thing is to be aware of what's going on and how we're responding, okay, to COVID, to stressors um, in our environment. B is just to have a balance. So when we think about B, we want to make sure we have balance everything, a balance um, diet plan or nutrition, balance the way in which we engage in physical exercise, a balance as it relates to targeting um, or tackling our own mental health issues, whether that's engaging in meditation, um, balance as it relates to connecting with others and not isolating, right? So A, again, is awareness. B is definitely balance. And C, um, again, is the connections. Connections is very important um, when we think about mental health specifically or the mind-body connection, okay? So connecting to others is going to be a big one. And that's what I really would leave for the people who are listening right now to the podcast. Awareness, Make sure you're balancing everything and really um, think about decisions. Think about that prefrontal cortex before we make any decisions as it relates to our mental health, diet, nutrition and exercise. um, And then making sure we connect with others. And this is where we'll be able to really become more resilient to to anything that comes our way. That's what I would want to tie in and leave our audience. Well, thank you. I think that. That's a good way to leave it. I always uh, think about my guests and think about what they what they feel they should focus on personally. And I'll kind of go through that again. The nest and the rope. And so nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, how we think, avoiding trauma. Everything we talked about was the nest for sure. <laughs> and then our relationships, organisms, avoiding pollutions, uh, having, you know, our emotions in check and, and making sure our life experience is service. So those are, that's what that acronym represents. As you think about your next year, is there a part of that nest or rope that you plan to give a little extra attention to? Absolutely. Um, so I think about in for nutrition <laughs> after Thanksgiving, I am really my goal for in thinking about the next year is less processed foods, right? So for me, I am really vowing to eat, to cook more and eat less um, processed foods as far as E, you know, I always start start with SMART goals. I think exercise, I already exercise pretty much about three times out of seven days. And I really would like to maintain that or some type of movement um, at least three to five times a day. As far as the S, the less stress, more sleep. I do get my sleep. I get eight to 10 hours a night. I do like that. But as far as the stress, I would like to continue employing the stress management techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, meditation, um, physical exercise to really target stress, whether that's compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma for me. And then T is how I think 
uh, and less trauma. You know, I want to resolve or continue to think positively. So when I wake up, I think about one positive thing um, that I'm going to do for the day. And then when I go to sleep, I think about one or a few positive things that's happened for that day. So those are some things that I'm going to try to implement thinking about the acronym NEST. Excellent. I actually, um, this past week, ironically, I started uh, thinking about name the things that went well today, even if it wasn't a good day, right? And I think that's a great way to end the day um, because you can at least close your eyes thinking about what went well. So I think it's just a nice, so it sounds like exactly what you're going to be doing. And I'm going to try to keep that habit going for a while. And that was, uh, you're the first person who actually did the entire nest. I'm impressed. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) <laughs> so you, you're, I guess it would make sense considering what you do for a living. So excellent. <laughs> it's like, yes, it's so yes. So, yes uh, this was actually I, fun. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it's, it's awesome. So I know you're not as uh, uh, involved in social media as myself, but is there a way for people to find you or uh, rather social media where you work? Absolutely. So if you're on LinkedIn, um, my name, Jasmine Searcy, and you'll find me and you'll see licensed uh, clinical psychologists. I would love to connect with uh, like minded individuals or collaborate or even meet others who uh, would like to continue the conversation. Absolutely. Sounds like a plan. Well, you know, I appreciate you. It was a pleasure. And, uh, and, and I don't think I mentioned this, but Couch Conversations with the Doctors yes. is where I met Dr. Jasmine Searcy. And as you may already know, that's Dr. Danny Davis's uh, Facebook Live that occurs on Monday night. And we talk about anything that the doctor can share. So she's our resident uh, behavioral health professional. And so we appreciate that service as well, doctor. So, cause we're both busy and then we find extra time to do stuff like <laughs> yes, that. Like, absolutely. What, what are we doing, right? <laughs> so yes. anyway, we gotta, we, we're serving. So thank you again. And I, I, I thank you and you have a wonderful rest of the day. And, and I'll, I'll say a few comments for my uh, listeners. Uh, today uh, we began the podcast with the statement written by Hippocrates and and the Hippocratic Oath, which reminds us to first do no harm. We also share the other famous statement from Hippocrates, let food be thy medicine. You know, one of the takeaways from today's lesson is uh, very simple. Let's protect our brains. And we should only love the lifestyles that love us back. That's the way I see it. So continuing to have lifestyles that do not serve you is really no different than stand, standing in an abusive relationship, to be honest. It's that you know crazy when you think about it. So it's reassuring to know that we all have the power to avoid the things that harm our mental health. We also learned that no drug or supplement really can balance our hormones. It really takes the nest, the nutrition, the exercise, the less stress, the more sleep, how we think and avoiding trauma. So I'm so happy, Dr. Cersei agrees. Yeah. All that ask is that you most definitely yeah. all that ask is to take whichever nugget you learn from Dr. Jasmine Cersei today and use it to protect your nest. You are now empowered with a few more tools to help guide you towards your health related goals. And I am just so happy, just like Pharrell was saying, everybody <laughs> listen, you should t- finish this podcast and go straight to YouTube and get that Pharrell song happy. And I guarantee you, when you listen to that song today, it's going to make you feel great. So I thank you. I appreciate you, Dr. Cersei. Nothing but love coming your way. And all I ask everybody listening to do is to be well and to continue to protect your nest. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Protecting Your Nest with Dr. Tony Hampton. For more visit drtonyhampton.com.